There was once a very deep, dark, dangerous cave. A dozen, dozens of miles deep and in every direction. And it had one small opening at the top. The cave was so dangerous for anyone to wander into that they put a guard at the entrance to it, 24 hours of the day, so that no one would in there out of curiosity or want to explore to see what was there and get lost in it because thousands of people had been lost in the cave over the many years. So the guard was put there to prevent people from going into the cave in the first place. So one day, while the guard was there, a man came along and he looked at the opening in the ground. He said, that's interesting, I'd like to go in there. It looks like something fascinating to explore. And the guard said, don't go in there. I'm put here especially to warn everyone against going into that deep, dark cave. Thousands of people have been lost there in the past, and if you go in there, you'll be lost too. Sir, I'm telling you, if you go in the cave, you'll be lost. And the man brushed the guard aside and rushed in before he could be stopped and was down several yards before the man could, the guard could tell him, don't go down there. So the man went down 10 yards, the cave, the winding, dark trail down there. And he had a little candle with him, but the candle went out when he got 10 yards down, so he had nothing to guide him anymore. So the guard looking down, he said, sir, come back up right now. If you go any further, you'll get lost. The man said, I'm going down. I'm a, I'm a hearty soul, so that a little light has gone out. I'm going to explore anyway. I'm a real adventurer. I'm courageous. I'm brave. I may be the first man to ever go down and explore this cave as I'm going to do. I'm an explorer, an adventurer. And the guard yelled down, come back. Don't go any further. The man went down further. He went down 20 yards. He went down 30 yards. The guard kept yelling down, come back, come back, don't go any further. The man kept going, kept going, until the guard's voice grew fainter and fainter and fainter. Finally, the voice of the guard couldn't be heard anymore. The man was so deep down in the dark twists and turns of the cave. He finally got lost down there. And he realized he was lost. And when realizing he was lost, he began to curse the guard. He screamed out in bitterness and hatred and despair. And he screamed out, why didn't someone warn me? Now you listen to me. I'm going to tell you that you value your fear. It's precious to you. You don't know how deeply valuable the haunted house is to you. You don't see that it's your food, it's your drink, it's your daily way of living. And you come to a meeting like this, or you read a book, and a truth or a reality or a fact is presented to you and the fear of that fact becomes the only defense you can think of because you have everything reversed what I am not just possessing but I am, am living what I am living is death if you have not risen above your ordinary mind, you're living in a state of death. There's no life to it at all. There's no life, there's no freshness, no spontaneity. There's only fear, tension, anxiety, wanting to hurt people, the whole thing. This false life, you should know by now, is so capable of telling you that this is all there is, that you put out your arms and embrace your fears as your friend, as your savior, as your life giver. Nothing is more, sounds more logical to you than to do this. Because you're saying, I, look, no man in his right mind, no woman in her right mind wants to die. 
you come along and offer to take away my fears of all these fears you're talking about, you come along and offer to lift these from me, you, you come, I offer to, I give you these truths and you hear this and you say, you say, if you take away my fear, that is death to me. And it sounds so logical to you, but you don't know the illogic in it. You, you see, you don't, you don't know what, how can I tell you? You don't know what life is. Do you understand that? You know what death is, but you call it life. You won't take the smallest project, many of you, and begin to die to death with it. You won't give up this insistence upon impressing people. You won't give up your drive for keeping yourself the center of attention. Take that one. You won't give up trying to be the center of attention, uh, favorably, of course. If you're ever the center of attention critically, then you, you run away. You want people to approve of you. You won't take that and give up the death, give, give up the pseudo-life, which is death, actual death, and wanting to be the center of attention, of wanting to be approved as if you care whether you're right or wrong as long as someone nods and says you're doing fine. See how shallow we are? We, do, we don't care whether we're right or wrong about something. We care whether we're approved or not. And if the majority approves, which the insane majority will always do, then we feel okay. We feel safe. Then we've got a lot of allies in fighting all the other people that don't have sense enough to see how right I am and how wrong they are. Knowing only the repetitious life, which is death, there's no, no originality in it, there's no spontaneity in it. Knowing only this, still living by labels, by words, you have to, you must call your present state of death life. Because you say, here I am in a physical body, I've got a mind, I've got all these feelings. This is what life is. You would better examine levels of life. A dog is alive. An oak tree is alive. A human body is alive. All right, the human body has life. Remember we one time said that it has no life of its own. Do you, do you know that nothing has life of its own? You know why? You understand why? Well, simply because there's such a thing as God. I'll ask you again. Did you uh, create this physical body you're living in? This money that you made today, that lot of money you made today, or last month or last year, uh, I don't understand. You, did you create the, the wood that you built the house with and then sold the house for a lot of money? Or you sold a car and made a lot of money? That beautiful hair that you're so proud of and that pretty dress or suit you're so proud of. Don't you see what you're, what you're attributing to yourself? As long as you attribute yourself to yourself, credit yourself, you're dead. Now, what is fear? The perfect word, the best word that I can think of just now, anyway, that causes fear is separation. Right? Hmm? Separation. Now, what does that mean? It means that the very small part of my essence, which could be developed, it may not be developed, but it could be. That part is so small and so smothered and the gulf is so wide between it 
and whatever is outside of it, which we call the universe, which we call God, which culture. The distance is so great, and here I am living in my thoughts, in my self-praise. I'm living in that and saying, saying at the top of my voice, I exist. As I say, I exist because I'm living from the opposites of my intellect. And the echo comes back. That's a lie. I don't want to hear the lie, so I scream twice as loud. I exist as this, as successful, as loved, or whatever. But because I live on the level of opposites, the voice comes back, you don't exist as that. I am loved. Something happens out there and I see that I, someone says, I don't love you. I don't want to hear that anymore. Because to me, that would be the death of the illusion that I'm loved. All fear is resonant in thought that says, I am what I believe I am. I am what I imagine I am. But who are you going to get to listen to you and go all the way through this exploration, what we've just talked about in the last five minutes isn't nearly enough. Who are you going to get to follow you, follow truth, all the way down, way down deeper, deeper, deeper into the dungeon, through all the animals living down there? Who are you going to find that will go all the way down there, see the facts, See everything so clearly that we've talked about, so there's no more choice. When you have no more choice, you're out of it. When you have no more choice, you have died to the illusion that there was an entity there that had a choice, that had power, that had decisions to make, practical decisions, of course. And even, even practical decisions are not yours. Who gave you the sense of thirst that you wanted a drink of water? And you say, well, I decide I want a drink of water. Where did you get the sense of thirst? Did you create that sense of thirst? You say, well, I decided to uh, go out to the social event. Well, it could have been one of two things, either your neurosis that drove you there or a conscious part of you that says, I'm going to go there because I've gone there before, but I'm going to do something different this time. I'm going to sit there and just watch everything that goes on inside me and outside me. So if the word separation explains our, the prodigal son, our apartness, apartness from truth, then the word union, the word self-unity, the word wholeness, the word self-completion is the opposite word that we can begin to use consciously, understandingly, to explain a state that is not a present state, which is one in which, if you're very watchful, you can go through your day and you can say to the devil, I don't live from you. Did you hear what I just said? Listen to what I said. Don't you forget what I just said. You say to the devil, I don't live from you not anymore how often do we talk about the devil whispering in our ear trying to tell us certain things trying to plant all kinds of suggestions in our mind all connected you know what they're connected with connected with money connected with security connected with a lot of these fears you talked about the devil says you you come to me you bow down and worship me you listen to me you serve me out in this world and I'll, I'll guarantee you these things. And the devil often comes through, not always because it's on the level of accident, but the devil very often comes through with his promises. And so you become famous maybe, become popular. You become what you call secure in this world. Housewives, I'm thinking of just now, who feel they're secure because they have a, a husband and children and a fairly nice home and a good income. The housewives are lost.
a new kind of a prayer will have to be developed by you. That prayer, I should use the word invited by you. And that prayer is what I just gave you. And don't you forget it. When you go out into the world tomorrow, when you have the break tonight, and you feel that temptation to be scared, to be bumbly, to be nervous, I want you to remember what I just said, which I'll repeat. This is an exercise. You understand, and I'll have to explain this more fully in a minute. When you turn to the devil, you turn to your own shaking, you turn to your uncertainty, and you turn to your weakness, you turn to your weakness. And you say, I'm not living from you anymore. That's an accurate statement. That's a cry of liberation. That's a recognition that you don't have to bow down and worship the riches of this world. You don't have to bow down and worship the thrill of anticipation of getting something tomorrow. You don't have to bow down and worship anything and lose your soul in the bargain for it. You try it. You think that's a you think that's a trivial thing? You see all the connections with it. I am not living from you anymore. You've taken yourself out of the office. Where all these bargains and all these promises which are going on in your mind which seem to be coming from the outer world in which they do in one sense, but you have received them. And you just stop coming to the devil's office where every morning he says, You can have this and you can have that but of course the price must be paid and the price that has to be paid is your eternity tell you what don't show up at the devil's office sometime and if he comes around looking for you which he will do he'll send his imps out to get you because he redoubles his efforts when he sees someone escaping and you say to him you, you say to that tension, you say, that, you say to that fear of poverty, that fear of death, you say that fear of losing someone, of not getting something, you say to that devil, I'm not living from you anymore. And you say it again, and you say it again, and over and over and over, until the meaning comes to you, until you begin to feel feel what you know. You'll begin to feel the strength. You understand it's just a statement and this is still dualism because this is someone still talking to someone else. But this, I say this is an exercise on your present level where you have to employ the opposites as the beginning. You turn and you say, I'm not living from you anymore and the time will come, I will guarantee you. And I'm not going to use the word believe, but you will know it. You'll know what you're talking from. And when you feel, when you feel that statement, when you feel that fact, when you feel the, the wisdom behind it, the fact behind it, the power behind it, you'll sit back in your chair and be very calm, very peaceful, and you'll know that all is well. How can I tell you more? I can tell you that if you will experiment for yourself see see you give up you're so used to giving up this is why it's good to go out into the world and try to accomplish something very difficult no matter, and the, the greater the odds the better i'm not talking about gambling when i say a thousand to one you go out and try to accomplish something and you stick with it and you stick with it and you stick with it it doesn't make any difference whether you succeed or not because your very persistent in persistence in trying to achieve something teaches you all sorts of things about how this world operates, the nature of this world. So finally you'll see that the power of persistence that you've used on these lower levels can transfer itself to your inner spiritual work. Until so you say to yourself, you know from yourself, no matter what the difficulty is, no matter what the fear is that we discussed early, no matter what it is, you know, you know, and, and it's very, very marvelous. 
you know you'll never, never, never give up until you win. The winning meaning your complete defeat. The feeling that you have way down for wanting to be strong, for not being afraid anymore, the feeling that all of you have for wanting, for wanting to be strong is legitimate. Why do you sit at these meetings night after night and maybe have a glimpse of strength and admire it instead of saying, that's for me? What am I going to do with you? Now, let me tell you something. I better break this down a little bit. I'm talking to you men more than to you ladies. What do you, what do you, uh, there's a reason for it. You weak, timid little men. You come to the, I'll start over, you come to these meetings night after night. And the ladies in this room want you to be strong. They hope you are. And what do they see? You, you think they don't detect your weakness here? I know they do, and they know they do. They have a right, the ladies, gentlemen, have a right to see you as being self-possessed, of being someone who even if you don't know, you're going to find out. Even if you're scared, you're going to find out why you're scared, and you've been told why you're scared. And you're going to go to all, all the way to the end of things. So you sit here, and everybody's disappointed. And I'll tell you, tell you what you're doing wrong. Still being asleep, and I'll change the descriptive word this time. Still living in a dream state. You're asleep, dreaming. You are. I know you are. You dream that you can accomplish certain things. You dream that you need to accomplish certain things. You name it. You know what you think you have to have. You, you say you have to have security. <laughs> you say you want security, and you don't... Why don't you find out what the word means? See, if I ask all of you, if you want security, you'd say yes. What are you, what are you yesing about? See? So you, in your dream state, you say you want security. Now a dreamer who says he wants security will then invent his own forms of fulfillment, won't he? Now you tell me what they are. What's your idea of security? Well, you ladies can come back now. What's your idea of security? I vow to you, some of you, your idea of security is to blab for a straight 20 minutes. That's right. Now you don't have to think. All you have to do is just turn on the button and off it goes. All you have to do is react the same way you always react to a challenge. There's a knock on the door. Who's there? You're scared already. If you wake up, you will find, you will find a, a, an interesting condition. You don't have to do anything. You just have to be someone. When you are someone, rightly, having awakened up, there's nothing left to do but live. Which you are not doing now. I don't know what your definition of life may be. But I'll tell you that life doesn't consist of nervously waiting for that knock on the door and then jumping when it happens.
we're going to work in this class to try, try to arouse in every one of you, men and women, arouse in you a kind of a feeling you have never ever had. I'll do my best with words to describe it to you. It's the letter no as tall as this room. Just picture the letter the word no, N-O, with an exclamation point as tall as this room. Now that's the kind of feeling you're going to have to develop when you're sitting in that room and there's a knock on the door and you, because you're in this dream sleep state, jump. You're going to learn in this class that while most certainly you're sitting in that room all alone, while you're sitting in that room, while the fear is there, while you're anticipating that knock, because the unexpected always associates with misfortune of some kind, punishment of some kind. While you're sitting in that room, I want you to learn to recognize the very first faint arising of your fear of a sound. You don't know what's out there. You don't know whether there's a a, a dragon or an angel out there, and yet you jump. Do you begin to understand what, what, what conditioned reflexes mean now? You have no idea of what's behind that door, no idea, but because you have a fearful nature and nothing but a fearful nature, you jump. And that's all you can do now. You do what you are. You always, you always do what you are. Or in other cases, you do what you are the dominating person at the moment, then you switch over to something else. All right, you've, you've come to these classes for a long time, and you've said, I'm tired. Let's see, let's see if you're tired enough to follow my next counsel to you. You sit in this room, you're working in the other room, you go to the office, and you see something, you see, I don't care what it is, you see something that begins to arouse this feeling of being scared, and you, you pull out that no as tall as this room, and even, I don't care how mechanical it is. I don't care, I mean it, I'm serious. I don't care when you get that, that glance from that man down at the grocery market, or that woman makes a slightly little snappy remark at you. I don't care if you have to reach into your pocket, physically, mechanically, automatically, to remember, I don't care if you have to reach in here and hold out a note and say no. I'm serious. And you put it back. You carry no with an exclamation point, large letters, in your pocket right here. The first instance of arousing of anything, you put one next to your chair in the TV room. You put another note there. You've got to remember to do this. And you see that newscast, something that, that makes you hateful, makes you angry, something that makes you jump. Or whatever you're doing around the house, you pull the note out. No. Where, where, where do you suppose that any human being who has found his way out, which doesn't mean anything to you because you haven't done it. But where do you suppose such a person started? Well, it's just the things I'm telling you to do. 
because I know that if you will be faithful to work on the level that you now are at, if you will do what you can do, you can do this. You can do it if you will obey something a little bit higher than your own laziness. You can do exactly what I say. You take that note out and you say no. It won't mean anything. You'll mutter it. You, some of you can't even talk clearly. You'll, you'll mutter it. And you won't even know what you're doing and you hope that no one saw you, that you do it anyway. You do it. And this is an order. You're to do this, every one of you, in your own way. Maybe not here, maybe in your, your purse or whatever. And you're going to learn to say no. This is the beginning of understanding. If you want to understand an automobile engine, you have to lift up the hood. Then you learn that's a spark plug and that's a carburetor or whatever. This kind of learning has its own, own exact, exact way for each one of you, at least, that you can follow. So maybe after doing this for a few years, sometimes without the note, eventually be able to do without the note, you can remember the word. After a time, your cosmic curiosity will be aroused and you'll say, you know, I sense something right about this. After doing it for all this time and think it was just some little exercise like a ge geography or history in the fifth grade, I thought it was something like that. Something higher in you is going to tell you there's something very right about this. This is the beginning of the higher feeling that we're talking about. I'll tell you. I'm going to tell you. You had better learn to scream. You had better learn to scream in a new way. You had better, better learn to scream with the power of something that isn't a part of your own apologetic rabbit-like nature. You had better learn to scream at the top of your voice, no. No to the knock on the door or that bad news or whatever. While you're still screaming, the work is incomplete. But you have to go through it because you're still divided. You're still a disciple. You're still learning what to do. You're still doing the mechanical parts which gradually the right feelings begin to take over. And the mechanical parts will remain because you're still, we're still mechanical on a certain level. Mechanical is, is, serves its purpose. As the feeling and the screaming of no to negativity to the devil, you're not going to live from him any, anymore. When it reaches its peak, when you've screamed with your whole psychic system, no, I'm not going to be afraid of death anymore. I should tell you that you're still afraid. See, you're still thinking about it. You're still divided. There's still you talking to something else. But I, I'm also telling you, and don't you forget this, this is a necessary stage. And when you've reached the very, the very peak of right feeling, the scream vanishes because there's no need for it anymore. You've transcended, you've risen above, you've risen above the very idea, you've risen above the very idea that there's someone here who has to carry a note to remind him to say no to the devil. You still think now, as I'm talking to you, that there's an entity, a person here who reaches down into his pocket and pulls a note out. I understand that. So these are elementary lessons. But it's the start, it's the kindergarten. The time will come. Didn't I tell you not to talk to the Tao? Remember? Don't converse with the Tao. If you converse with him, you're meeting him on his own terms. And he can be very subtle in conning you. 
but this is a stage. You understand, don't you, that God has nothing to do with the devil? Light has nothing to do with darkness. We use these as simple, simply as terms to make things clearer to us. God has no rivals. He has no opposites. He has no, no, nothing to scream at. What I've described to you on this, this maximum scream, when you've reached its peak, all of a sudden you collapse and die to the illusion that there's someone there to collapse and die. And that's it. It never occurs you to occurs to you to examine the goal you have set up, to try to figure out. Well, let's see now. If I get a million dollars, if I get that woman, I get that man, I get that home, I get that education. If I get that. What a blasted idiot I am to prophesy that that's going to make me feel complete. Because look, I know very well that I've had goals before. I've had hundreds of them. I've had thousands of them. Ah, I see. I see a little bit now. I understand. I understand what my error was took all this time to get through my thick head, but I understand what the mistake was. The mistake was lying to myself, pretending to myself, trying to convince myself that no matter what the action is, no matter what it is, trying to convince myself that it will fulfill me. And I hang on to that hope, on to that so-called progress, and the journey itself becomes my false reward. As long as I can keep my hope up that the end of the journey, if I can keep my hope up that the end of the journey is going to fulfill me, then I'll feel okay. I never see for once that the accumulation of lies about what I'm doing and where I'm going will always end in the same emptiness, the same shock, the same disappointment, the same crying. I never, never see that I end up in the same place by doing the same thing. Do you know, look, I'm talking to you people sitting in front of me right now. I'm going to tell you something that you don't know about yourself. You're living in a fool's paradise, every single one of you. Who are you depending on? Who have you got in your life? What man? What woman? What people? What condition do you have in your life that makes you feel good? Your salary? How foolish. The fact that you can always make a phone call and call someone and talk to someone or write a letter. Or you have a book on your shelf that's your favorite book of comfort or guidance. You have places to go, you have your favorite bar, your favorite party, your favorite circle of friends. Why is it, for heaven's sake, that you don't see you're not living from truth at all? You're not living from yourself at all. You're living from a delusion that your present state is a secure one because it remains what it is from one minute to the next. From one minute to the next. Don't you understand that there's something beyond one minute and beyond five minutes and beyond ten minutes? Don't you understand that there's something higher than any kind of time thinking that your mind engages in? What I'm saying is this, if you're following me. Do you know why you're scared? Do you know why you're so shaky and insecure? Why you can't settle down? Why you're restless? Why you keep wandering around from place to place internally and trying to match it externally? 
Here's a part of you that is dimly aware of the self-deceptive game that you're playing on yourself. I've told you before and I'll tell you again. I want all of you to do a little work with me right now. What person, what group of people, what circumstance is presently in your life that if you were to lose it would knock out your smugness would knock out your pretense that all is well. And you know very well, and I know very well, that it's just a pretense because you know how scared you are. You know how insecure you are. You know how some circumstance, some person could knock the prop out from under your smugness, your illusion that things are okay. Oh, well trouble with that is you never get rid of your masks you never get rid of the little tricks that you play when something does get taken away from you when you lose something when something changes when someone goes away you lose your money or whatever you always have your little bag of tricks to play for example well tomorrow will be different because I've got plans You better listen to what I'm going to tell you tonight. There's no plan whatever that any of you here can make that will take away the ache. And you know what the ache is. You walked into this room with it, and you'll walk out of it with that same ache. Unless you pay a special attention to what I'm saying and start to work on it, you could, in theory, walk out of here without the heartache. You won't because there's too much work to do. But if you could see and absorb and listen to something higher, if you listen to something higher than the interpretation you are now putting on what I'm telling you right now, you could walk out of here and be in a different world. I don't care what the weather is out there, all wet and rainy as it is. You could walk out of here with an internal state that recognizes the rain, and I'm sure you'd watch not to walk into a puddle, and you'd turn on the windshield wipers of your car, and you'd drive carefully. All the same time that that is going on, you would know that you are a different human being than the one who walked into this room. Why would you be a different human being? Well, you've gone down the path down a certain point where you say, say as sincerely as you can, all the plans have come to nothing. All the books, all the meetings I've come to have come to nothing. I had better do something more than come to meetings and read books. You may be hit by the astonishing thought that there's an intelligence, not just in this world, but there's an intelligence with a capital I. It's not just in the universe or in this world, but right in this room here tonight and closer, closer to you than that, right inside your own system, that there's an intelligence that knows more than this gentleman does or this lady does. There's an intelligence that can think for you, to use the word think deliberately, think for you in a way which you could never do for yourself. Isn't it true, come on now, isn't it true that you've pretty much run out of resources, of ways to turn? Come on, how many ways have you turned in your 30, 40 years here on earth? If you have found the answer, if you, if you know what the answer is, what, what are you doing here in this room tonight? Now you say, why, why, do, why make a statement like that? Because I know you better than you know yourself. I know how stubborn you are, how mulish you are. I know how you are unaware of the subtle, cunning tricks that your own system is playing on you, right as you are hearing me. 
I know some of the comments you'll make to yourself or to someone you came with when you walk out of this room tonight. My purpose as the teacher here is to make you aware of everything that goes on inside you all the time, of course, but as a special value while you're here listening to me. And that's a very bare elementary stage where you can begin to understand that while you're sitting here listening, there are all kind of reactions to you. Some may be negative, some may be rightly positive, some may be doubtful, some might be affirmative, some might be a little foggy, some might be just a little bit clear, but all sorts of thoughts and feelings are going through you. We've led you up to a certain point now, and we'll go further. I'm sure you've heard that the human mind, the feelings, the inner condition that we live in is capable of a certain amount of work, of energy, is capable of doing certain things. Your mind is capable, let's run a few off, your mind is capable of reasoning, of certain kinds of logic, it's capable of reviewing situations, it's capable of correction, it's capable of self-examination, capable of remembering certain things that could be valuable to you, remembering certain errors that you made, for example. The mind and the feelings and the whole psychic system that all of us have here in this room is capable of a certain, now here's a key word, and don't you forget it, a certain, of certain elementary work. Now, most human beings use the power of reconsideration of pondering of remembering of correction they use this only for their daily living daily life in the home where they work that is they use the powers of their mind and of their whole inner self to get by in this world and to get by as greedily as they can make as much money as they can be as popular as they can impress people as much as they can try to feel as safe as possible, secure, and of course they're not because you're not in a secure world out there. So most people use their mind, these elementary powers, mental powers, in order to get by in this world. And it doesn't work at all for them. You mean to tell me that a, a person's mind is working properly and correctly as it could work when they're unhappy, when they're hostile, when they have nightmares, when they have headaches, when they scowl, when they sneer, that's obviously not the right work of a mature mind. But we're talking about us here in this room and what we're trying to do as human beings who have reached a certain point where we're not satisfied with our lives as we are and as they are and we want to do something different. Oh, I'm afraid the sad description that I just gave still applies. You know if I ask you to raise your hands, I'm sure you'd raise them. How many of you are envious? How many of you can be very petty at times? How many of you cling to someone else, wanting someone else to think for you, to make your decision for you? How many of you get a thrill out of just going somewhere, just doing something, never seeing that it's purposeless, talking on the phone for a half hour when there's no point in it at all, but you have nothing better to do with yourself? Or you're supposed to write a letter to someone, you sit down and agonize, how should I start, what should I say? You go through a minor hell just in trying to write a simple letter to someone, right? You've done that, haven't you? You go to work and you fight with other people and there's suppressed hostility between you and another worker. Then you come home and there's the bills piling up. This is not using the elementary energies, elementary principles properly at all. Now, many of you have been coming to these talks for a long, long time. Some of you are fairly new. And I want to tell you, or rather, let me put it another way. Let me ask you why you haven't even begun to use your mind in a mature way. How come you still make the same mistakes you made two or three years ago? You're still as worried as you were when you first started coming to this class. You're still as jittery, so uncertain as to what you were all about and what life is all about. I want to make it very clear to you 
that whether you're in this class or there's someone out in the world there, it's pretty much conclusive that we're not using the elementary powers which God has given us at birth. They have not been developed properly. They have not been exercised. They have not been used. Rather, unfortunately, they have been punishing ourselves. You know what punishment heartache is, what punishment loneliness is. So the very principles, powers, energies that have been given us in order to grow, in order to evolve, in order to become mature, because there's something wrong with what we're doing with them, they become our enemies instead of our friends, instead of our helpers. Correct? I described your life? Of course, you know that. You are going to have to start much lower than you have up till now. In these classes, you hear astonishing things. You hear things that are a thousand miles up in the sky about the cancellation of time, about being aware instead of being in thought. And you take all these things as if there's something that you understand, that you comprehend, and you don't. So tonight, we're going to have to start farther back, and I've always tried to do that by telling you how poorly you use your minds, how unaware you are of the expression on your face, of where your hands are right now, for example, seated in this room, the tension you might have in your jaws. You're unaware of how you can start at a very low level and begin to develop your powers of thinking correctly, of reacting correctly, of reviewing correctly of the wish to make progress correctly, you can begin to see that you haven't used them correctly, which is pretty much of a blow to our vanity, to our conceit, but which is quite necessary. If you don't know, if you don't know how much hidden conceit you have in you, then you'll have to go through that, which is a good thing, not a bad thing. It's always a good thing for us to see where we're not thinking correctly because we assume we already understand. And you go out of here and make sarcastic remarks about the talk tonight, about other people tonight. Let me ask you why you live on such a low level of understanding that you find it necessary to make sarcastic remarks. What's the matter with your brain, man? Oh, oh, I see. You feel threatened by the truth. Why don't you investigate that? Why don't you find out why you feel so threatened by what you're hearing here. The man is so negative, you're saying. That's what everybody says. That's what all people say who want to remain lost. And why don't you examine the fact that you do say the same old things, do the same old things, worry about the same things, and of course, always blame someone else for the problem that you have. It's always someone else's fault. Just the other day, we had a very short lesson that that's a sign of a very sick mind. It's that man's fault. It's my parents' fault. It's society's fault. Little cowards never take responsibility for the fact that they are in a certain condition. I don't care what anybody has ever done to you up to this point in your life that you're seated here tonight. You or I, if I'm doing it, are a coward by not saying, look, here is my situation. Maybe I had begun to begin to use my powers of reasoning, of logic, of self-responsibility, of self-reliance, of self-initiative, in order to see how I am punishing myself by being bitter and hard. Oh, that would be the beginning of using your mind correctly, instead of using it for self-destructive purposes. Most people don't want this, what we're talking tonight. We have a city here of 6,000 people, 8,000 people, something like that. A very few percentage of them here tonight. Now follow carefully what we're going to say next. You're going to run into some astonishing things. If you will indeed spend several years, if you'll spend several years developing your elementary powers of thinking, of logic, of being thoughtful instead of being emotional, of watching how you wander off the road of, of log- logic all the time and get wander way off there, watching how you can't stop talking, how you worry about things. If you could indeed begin to use your mind, develop your mind as it can be developed. I'm telling you, it can be developed. It's take many, many years. 
and some of you will have to get rid of all these phony emotions that you you like to let loose first and all your dramatics get rid of that when you get to the point where you can think clearly without yourself being involved in it without turning everything to self-reference how is that going to hurt me or how is that going to benefit me when you do that and can use all these basic elementary powers correctly you'll have a marvelous I'll use the word a marvelous spiritual experience listen what it is it might sound strange to call it a spiritual experience but you you don't know how beautiful it is when you have developed the ordinary powers of thinking of being mature mentally of not being a scared little rabbit when you can face life clearly at a certain level you will see the limitations this is the miracle listen to this the first miracle you will experience will be the, the clear awareness consciousness knowledge of the limitations of what you have developed so highly up to this point All right. so you see you're going to have to start way way back to see that you can't live properly with the tools that God has given you at birth God gave all of us at birth we don't use them rightly at all we break the tools instead of using them now you see if we begin to use them rightly and you're going to have to do a lot more of this every one of you never mind being spiritual you just start use your mind right when someone comes up to you you look at that instead of reacting with anxiety over the expression on his face or you you have to pay more for the bill than you expected to pay instead of hating the man who gives you the bill why don't you watch your own hatred and your slavery to a piece of paper that's a long ways off for all of you every one of you don't know how long that is off but we're going on so you work for all these years and you begin to get the rewards of having a mature mind of being able to re react from something that is not your petty self and because you haven't reached a, a higher point yet you assume that this is it you assume that this is happiness you assume that this is spirituality you assume that you've gone as far as you can go in this life if you keep going a step beyond that that delusion that you've gone as far as you can will also begin to fade out and then the miracle will occur which is this you see the limitations the, bear, the borderline beyond which you cannot go with the tools you have developed so highly up until this point look look in your business gentlemen you have learned to be very logical you're not emotional when you making a sale you're logical about it you look at the facts you look at the figures and you either make the sale or you don't make the sale but you don't get you don't don't get thrown by it either with disappointment if you don't make the sale or you don't get elated ego elated if you do make the sale you've developed your mind right on the level of ordinary things you ladies have developed your mind in a certain way to cook or take care of the children or whatever you do and you understand that you are logical now where you were emotional and illogical before because you can begin to compare now at this point if you keep going developing yourself more and more and more you will see both an astonishment and a sh and something that will shock you and dismay you you will see that while you are logical why you can add up figures why you can conduct your business very efficiently you know how to buy and you know how to sell and you know how to take care of the house you know how to take care of the kids you know how to whatever you do you're still unhappy you're still worried you still have nightmares and you still have headaches and you still don't know what to do with yourself or where to go for help and this is a great shock to you because you had assumed that happiness came with logic 
you assumed that being a, what you called a free human being came with thinking in a certain way. You even are above, you are even above the point where you used to think that making a lot of money or having a lot of friends or getting a certain object or person, you're even above where, where you used to think that that would make you happy and you understand that that doesn't make you happy, but you still think something else will. But now I have to think what it is. I have to think what it is, but what is it? Is it could it be what we call getting spiritual? Could it be going on a trip? Could it be meditating? But I don't know what that means. I don't know. Oh, you think you're worse off than you were before. And, and a part of you, not very long though, because you've made some progress already, a part of you kind of wishes you were back in, in the smirking misery that you used to be in. You know, you could, you could put on the phony smile and pretend, and that distracted you a little bit from your doubts, and that seemed to be better than where you are now, but you don't keep that very long, because you've made some progress. But you're still very worried, very puzzled. Here, I've developed myself. I certainly have. I really know. I understand human nature a lot better than I used to. I know how tricky people are. I know how tricky I am, and I understand that. What do I do next? What you can do is 100% clearly see the limitation of the ordinary elementary tools that you have been using. They are capable not of making you happy, but they're capable of building buildings and baking a cake and things like that. They are not capable of making you happy because you haven't seen what is necessary next. Now you've, you've taken the instruction from your mind and at this point comes a second revelation. The first one was that you've reached the limit of where you can go. But if you've reached the limit of how far you can go and you're still not really free and happy, then what do you do next? You'll spend many, many years pondering this question. If I have developed myself to a certain point, and I do know certain spiritual truths, I've read lots of books, and I know they're right. I know, I know you can't live a conceited life and be happy. I know you can't hurt other people without hurting yourself. I know, I know that. But I'm still thinking about these things, and I'm still, still worried. So what do I do next? At this point, it occurs to you that all thinking creates someone who thinks about himself. All thinking creates a person with this name or that name or this name. All thinking creates this person. And then you begin to see how the residue of your wrong thinking tries to feed this person. And then, and then here's a long leap now and you have to follow this. Then you have to see that your concern over not being able to go any further is a part of this self-reference. <sighs> if I worry over where I'm going to go next, then is not that worry a part of my intellect, of my thinking process? Therefore, isn't that thinking, nece it's necessary to leave that behind, discard that, because it refers to a me, and I suspect that that me is fictitious. What if I'm so clear in my mind that I understand that all references to me are on the level of these elementary thoughts and used wrongly, and I see that there's no me there, therefore it's not necessary even to ask the question, but where do I go from here in order to be happy? If I cease to ask, how can I go higher spiritually in order to be happy? If I don't ask that question, don't I cease to create a me who has to go anywhere? I've got it all these years. I've got it. Now, 
if I can't think it out, and I can't, if I don't have to think it out any further than using my mind as best I can, as I have done, I spent many years of apprenticeship thinking well, thinking instead of emotionalizing, thinking instead of dramatizing. If I don't have to think my way higher, what do I do? Again, the wrong question, right? Right? I give up. Now, if I have given up, who is there to be saved? If I give up, who is there to go any higher? To give up being someone who has to go higher is the going higher. But it's not me. The me has been left behind. If I seek happiness, I'm seeking happiness for a fake. And he'll get fake answers because the fake man invites fake answers. Riches, whatever, fame, whatever it might be. If I cease trying to make Vernon happy, Dorothy happy, if I cease trying to make us happy, what happens? No one there to make any effort, right? All right. For your information then, there are energies, there are forces, there are powers that are higher than mine, that are higher than yours. There is such a thing as knowing instead of thinking. There is such a thing as thinking, as, excuse me, there's such a thing as seeing instead of reasoning. There's such a thing as sitting back and understanding without the operation of thought. Having left myself behind having seen quite clearly, there's no point dragging me anywhere. If I drag me up until what I call heaven, it'll be hell because I'm there, right? Is there any hell outside of your mind? Now, don't you say the other person's mind, that may be true of him, but what do you care about him? You don't really, you know. And if you have a false care, you're, you're neglecting your own work here. Having seen that the only thing that makes any sense at all is to give up, you have in, now you can go into spiritual talk if you want, spiritual phraseology, and I'm sure you've read it. You've seen there's nothing for you to, to do but to abandon yourself. Not that there's anyone to abandon. There never was. But you understand that, and that's what the abandonment consists of. To see that there's no one there to let go of anyone, and no one to let go. N n nothing. The whole thing was thought operating as opposite. Having seen that, you allow these higher powers, higher forces, to literally, to use it, make it clear, to come right down inside our own psychic system to instruct us in a way in which our logic and our memory and our reviewing and our corrections and our wish for something higher can instruct us in a way in which they never could. Because you see, the I is always uninstructable. There is no one to be instructed. There's only someone, a human being, who can start to work on himself, watch himself work inwardly, until he understands that there's no one there, not really, there's no entity there who can learn anything. What we can do is get rid of the illusion that I can add knowledge to me, because there's no me to add knowledge to. So when I disappear and when you disappear, then there's state which we call freedom, state which we call liberty from, liberty from looking around for something to make me feel secure. Oh, then, then am I a slave to losing that man, or losing that woman, losing that reputation, which was phony anyway? Then does life have a problem anymore? Now, there's one thing you have to do in order to progress. Think of, the, think of this following phrase. 
keep your yearning pure. Keep your yearning pure. Now that isn't easy. If you, any of you seated here in this room, have a yearning for something different than what you've had in the past, that's legitimate. So far, it's legitimate. We, we, you yearn to, to be what you call being happy instead of being miserable. Fine, great. That's a proper yearning. If you start to add things to it, if you start to add yourself to it, for example, then the yearning becomes impure, and you will find what you want to find, but you won't find what will set you free of yourself. At every step along the way, you have to watch this very original yearning, desire, longing that you have inside of yourself to try to change something. And then if you see yourself depending on your husband, depending on your wife, depending on, a, on any human agency at all, depending on that to make you feel secure, then you've already made the yearning impure by saying maybe that person knows the answer, and I'll guarantee you that he doesn't, that she doesn't. You'd better face the fact at the very start of your journey that you are all alone and must remain alone because we're so easily contam contaminated by people by the slightest little remark. And devils can make slight little remarks, can throw you off. Don't you listen to anyone. You start listening to your own self inside and then you can tell whether another person is telling you the truth or not, but don't you listen to them and make a judgment from that. The yearning has to be kept as pure as it was when it started. And if you will do that, that gives, that gives you an opportunity to see, to be, even begin to understand the development of your elementary powers of thinking, of reflecting, of changing. As that goes higher and higher and higher and you keep the yearning pure, you don't contaminate it by twisting things according to your own self-conceit. You keep it pure. The time will come when you will understand a very important point tonight, and don't you forget the very important point, where you finally see the limitation of ordinary efforts the limitation of ordinary thought. When you see that, that will be, be both a revelation and a crisis. Because the first thing you're going to ask, well, if I can't think my way out, how do I do it? And I've already answered that by saying the very asking of the question, how do I think my way out, is a wrong question. And if you've dissolved the question, there'd be no need for it, and therefore no need for an answer. Keep your yearning pure all the way to the point where you begin to dissolve yourself, and as you grow thinner and thinner and thinner, this allows the higher force to come down and to teach you, teach you directly. This is what you can call spiritual intuition if you want, so that you know without thinking. And you're authentically happy because you don't have to think about ways to be happy. Now I'm here to tell you that you have been told a lie by your own mind through your own ignorance, so your own, through your own unwillingness to give up, to explore. I'm here to tell you that there is another world that the one that your own misguided mind has told you about. And I will describe this world in the only way it can be described, because it's not describable. It is a world which, in which there is an absence of your usual daily experiences. You won't have concern over money except on the practical level, of course. We understand that, that you're thrifty and things like that. You won't have concern for your human relationships. My God. I've lived long enough. I have lived long enough worrying whether you're going to stay with me or leave me for heaven's sake go or stay but i am not going to be a part of it i'm fed up to my ears with worrying over money whether i'm going to have enough i can't tell you how sick and tired i am of looking at the news on television at 5 30 and starting the worry cycle all over again for a half hour and then continuing for the next day and the next month y 
even when I don't know what to do and don't know where to go to get out of this monstrosity that I call life, I know I'm going to start to do something different. And you, you news commentators and you government people and you church people and you wife and you husband and you children and you parents, God help me. I'm not going to be tied to you anymore. If it's necessary for me to go through the hell of giving up my expectations of tomorrow, then I give it up right now. And I tell you, if the devil who's had me for all these years comes back and hounds me one second after I've made the declaration to be free, I'm going to declare my freedom again. And if you come back with all the guilts and shames you want to impose on me, and if you want to threaten me with death, devil, you go ahead and threaten me with death. And I'm going to set myself free. There's, it's too late, devil. It's too late. I've seen something. I've seen the fraud and the fake that you are. And I know I'm not out of it. I know I'm in hell. I, I know I'm still burning. I know, th I know that. But I've done one thing. I've seen through your devilish device of telling me to live in time, and I'm not going to do it anymore. When I, for example, when I see the, the hell of heartache, of loneliness, of worry surging through me, I'm not going to go into time thinking about it at all, but I'm going to look inside myself and see that that hell is going on right now. I'm going to see that the hell is going on right now, and I don't even, I don't even know whether there's a God who can help me or not. That's no concern of mine either. I'm not going to label a God. I'm not going to invent a God who's going to save me from anything. I'm going to see what's going on inside me. I'm going to examine without calling on help because you have tricked me for the last time in calling on my self-created God, which is created out of time. I'm not going to pull my God out of Sunday school when I was 10 years old. I'm not going to pull a God that's going to save me from hell out of a book that I get out of the library that talks all about God and Christ and Mohammed and Zen Buddhism. I'm not going to think at all. I'm going to see what's happening at the present moment. I'm going to stay in now. When you realize that, when you say that very consciously, the devil's fires go down one degree. And when you say it the next day, they go down two degrees. And when you say it the third day, it goes down the next degree, on down and down, down, down. Till the angelic life, the angelic impressions are now inside you right now, not tomorrow, right now. And you know that you have been rescued for eternity. I'm telling you that you don't have to die asleep. Now what are you going to do about it? If you go away from this class and don't come back to any more classes, you're going to die in your sleep. But you won't know it. When you die in your sleep, you won't know it. Because you never woke up. Therefore, you never knew you were asleep. You only know you're asleep when you begin to wake up and can begin to look back and see the state you are in. Look back and see the state you are in without, again, being horrified by it. Because if you're horrified by the state that you see, you're still identified with it, and you're still asleep. You have to be nobody. You can't be anybody and be awake. You simply have to be impersonally awake, seeing everything and not being afraid of anything or anyone, any circumstance, any future. You, you know, you know you're untouchable. No matter what the, what the world does to you, you're untouchable. You've got something that isn't of this world. You know about the other world now. You know it and you live in it. And that, and that awareness, that consciousness, that living in that new world, 
then makes you adequate and makes you sane as you presently also, without division, live in the physical world. When you, when you are sane, that very sanity never for one millionth of one degree ever tolerates insanity. Not that you can do anything about it, not that you have to do anything about the insanity of those people out there. We're trying to make the sanity appear here. Then I'm no longer contributing to it as I used to do, as you used to do. Are you, any of you aware of how you used to contribute to the, the pain and the heartache of this world? And what you did unto the world, you did unto yourself at the same time. Why don't we all make an agreement tonight at about 10 to 8? Why don't we all make an agreement to call it off? To not do it anymore. To not go along with it. You don't have to go along it. There's something else. The people you're living with and the people you know and the people you work with, they don't want to go. They don't want to travel to this other world. They want to stay right where they are. They're so happy in their sickness, in their misery. One value of this class is that you are associating with other people who want to be something different than what they now are. As bad off as we may be, and it's pretty bad, there's a little part of us that says, I want to find something else. You come here, and you work on yourself, and you will find something else. You won't have to be a self-tormentor anymore. You won't have to hide out in the closet, fearful of what's outside that door as you now are. You can get out of the closet and go out and the, roam the whole house you can go anywhere and do anything you want to do, and you'll never hurt yourself or anyone else doing it. You won't be, you won't be burdened by all the guilts and the shames that other people do. You won't want revenge on anyone. I said you won't want revenge on anyone as you now do. You may not hit someone, but you'd like to, wouldn't you, at times? The blow out there comes right back to you and hits you right in here and you're making yourself sick you're making yourself physically sick emotionally ill the world is walking right by the river of water of truth the water of truth in that river the world walks right by it not wanting it They've got their eyes on gold of some kind. They've got their eyes on something in time and space. They want something to possess. They want something to hang on to and say, now I've got mine. If you ever say I've got mine, you're a brute. You're a brute. When you have nothing, you have everything you need.